book talking about the 12 heroes, I'd like to kind of give you the backstory of, of this book. And it happened at that little coffee group when someone said, I wonder how many Aggies have won the Distinguished Service Cross and Navy Cross. And we guessed, you know, 25, 30, you know, in that range. So <clears throat> after that, I got to thinking about it. I thought, well, you know, somebody needs to, to uh, document this. How many Aggies do we have that won the Medal of Honor, uh, not the Medal of Honor, but the uh, Distinguished Service Cross, Navy Cross, or the Air Force Cross? That's the second level, right below, right, right below the uh, uh, Medal of Honor. And usually when a person gets the Distinguished Service Cross, it kind of tells you they were probably recommended for a Medal of Honor, but it was uh, downgraded and they got the Distinguished Service Cross. So I did started a lot of personal research and I called, called this Project Ali, Aggie Valor. And I went over to farmer students and looked through years and years of old Texas Aggie books and magazine, uh, magazines and, and newspapers. And all in all, I came up with 65 Aggies that have won Distinguished Service Cross, Navy Cross, or the Air Force Cross. In fact, I discovered that my doctor's father won the Air Force Cross. So I thought, yeah, you know, my, I'm giving you my thinking now that, that these guys ought to be honored in some way. Well, there was no way I was going to write a book with 65 people. It took me three years to write a book with seven people. So I figured that out. I'd be about 110 by the time I finished it, or if I ever finished it. So <clears throat> I, I thought, well, you know, we need to honor some of these heroes. So I went to, uh, I think, 11 or 12 military historians, Aggie military historians, and people that uh, are interested in a uh, and military history. And I said, tell me the 12 people you would include in this book. I started out with the top 10, and I thought, well, you know, we're Aggies, we, we'll go 12. That, that's very significant. So I, I got uh, the reports back, and there was a general consensus on, on most of the people that are in this book. However, there, there were a number of people that were, uh, had distinguished military careers that you should write a book about. But see, those were Eisenhower's, and I was looking for patents, so I wanted warriors. I wanted people that had actually been in combat and, you know, been there and done that. So I wound up with the 12 that I have in the book. But I was the guy that made the decision. I got the advice from other people, but I, it was my choice. Okay, this is George Fleming Moore, the defender of Corregidor. He was born in Austin, but he moved to Eden shortly thereafter. His father was an attorney, and he's the namesake of George Fleming Moore, who was the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court. So he came to a and uh, and at that time, of course, you were in the Corps of Cadets, and that, in 1904, the Corps numbered 414. Now, he played on the football team, and he lettered in 1907 and 1908. I love that uniform. And this is him later on when he was a general officer. <clears throat> he entered the Army uh, about a year after graduating from a and He served in World War I, but he was in the Ordnance Corps and did not go overseas. He had two tours, he was Coast Artillery Officer, he had two tours on Corregidor back in the 30s. He was the Commandant of Cadets, 1937 to 1940, and it was during this time that the Corps d'Arms were built, and guess what those 12 Corps d'Arms and Duncan Hall cost? Two million dollars. Now you couldn't even renovate one d'Arm over there now for two million dollars. In fact, they're, I don't know what they're, uh, Someone told me 48 million they're spending or something, and that's not all 12 dorms. But anyway, uh, $2 million was a lot of money in that, those days. I guess it's a lot of money today when you get right down to it. <clears throat> in 1940, he returned to Corregidor. There were four other, what they call fortified islands, and they, you see three there and then one up in Subic Bay. Uh, Corregidor was about two miles off of the coast of Bataan. And there's a, another picture of Corregidor, about uh, one mile this way and about three, three and a half miles that way. It looked like a tadpole, and they referred to it as the tadpole. When uh, 
Japanese struck Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941. This was followed by attacks in the Philippines and uh, the U.S. forces were pushed back into Bataan where they made a last ditch stand but eventually uh, they were overrun. Now this is some of the fortifications on Corregidor. That's a 12 inch mortar. That will help throw a shell of, of about a thousand pounds uh, nine and a half miles. There were 10 of those on uh, Corregidor. And this is the disappearing gun. It's also 12 inch and it'll shoot about uh, 14 miles, a, a thousand pound shell. The problem was that the Japanese, when they came down in Bataan and overran Bataan in April of 1942, they also had all these prisoners and the people on Corregidor couldn't, couldn't fire there because they'd be firing on their own people. But after a month of bombardment, both air and from, the, uh, from Bataan, uh, all of these guns were destroyed. So they didn't, they didn't get much use out of them. Now, this is detailed in John Adams' book, so we won't, we won't take his thunder. But after continuous bombardment, Corregidor surrendered on 6 May, and Moore was taken a prisoner. He remained a prisoner of the Japanese for three and a half years, and all that's detailed in, in my book of where he goes and how he's treated and so forth. And to make, uh, this is hard for me to understand, but after he was a prisoner for three and a half years of the Japanese and was returned to the States, what did the Army do in 1946? They sent him back to the Philippines, of all things. I think that was terrible, but anyway, he went back to the Philippines. He was the commander of the Western Pacific Forces. He retired in 1949 and died that same year, and he's buried in the uh, Golden Gate National Cemetery in California. A.D. Bruce, he, he's known as the father of Fort Hood. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and moved to Mercedes, Texas when he was a young man. And his father was a land developer in, in real estate. He entered A&M in 1912 to study dairy husbandry. And he was commissioned and he was sent to France in 1917 where he commanded a machine gun company and later a machine gun battalion and he, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross during his uh, time in, in France in World War I. In 1928, he was assigned as the Commandant at Allen Academy in Bryan. At that time, Allen Academy had won the Golden Star, the Honor Star. They had a federal inspection each year and uh, awarded a, a blue star if, you're, if you were an honor school and Nat was it Nat, whatever his name was, Allen, Nat Allen, uh, was the president, superintendent of Allen Academy. He was so proud of that honor school designation, he said that was what caused the uh, increased enrollment in Allen Academy. Well, Bruce was assigned there as a captain, and guess what, that year they did not get the gold star. And uh, it, it's, it's quite a long story. I ran across this, this by accident, this story. I'd never seen it anywhere before, but in some of my research, I ran across this and went out to Allen Academy and talked to some of the people, and they didn't know much about it. But anyway, uh, put together this story, and uh, <clears throat> it, all that's in the book. But anyway, the, uh, Mr. Allen contacted the Army and said, get this guy out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and so they relieved Bruce and replaced him with another Army captain. But evidently the Army wasn't too concerned about it because they, they sent him to command the General Staff School from there, which is a, uh, one of the necessary stepping stones for promotion in the Army. So he did all right there. In uh, 1941, the Army became, or 1940, the Army became very concerned about tanks because of the German blitzkrieg that overran France. And uh, Bruce was on the uh, Army staff and he was tasked to write a study about uh, you know anti-tank warfare or anti-tank capabilities for the US Army and as a result of his report he was selected to form the first uh, tank destroyer center which was down at uh, Colleen Texas which was Fort Hood they were 
Fort Hood now, it was Camp Hood at that time. So he had to develop this tank destroyer center. He had to create a new branch in the military forces, a tank destroyer. And <clears throat> he was uh, shortly promoted to Brigadier General. There's a picture of, of uh, A.D. Bruce as a general. And this is Fort Hood. In fact, when I was at Fort Hood several times, that was our division headquarters, and that wasn't that many years ago. But anyway, it's gone now. But that was the tank destroyer headquarters in 19, about 1942. Now, this was the first tank destroyer. It was a half track with a 75 millimeter cannon uh, mounted. Now, this particular vehicle is out at the Museum of the American GI. That's where I took this picture. But uh, that was not a very successful anti-tank gun or weapon. Uh, but he did fight in North Africa, but he was soon replaced with, uh, with another tank destroyer. I'll, I'll have a picture of that a little, little later. Bruce was selected to command the 77th Infantry Division, and they uh, invaded Guam in the Pacific. Later on, he, the 77th Division went on to fight in the Philippines and o Okinawa. And then uh, at the end of the war, he was sent to Korea to command the 7th Infantry Division as part of the occupation of Korea. He served as the Commandant of the Armed Forces Staff College after that. And then he was selected, after he retired from the Army, he was selected to be the President of the University of Houston and eventually became the Chancellor. Now, he fought one more battle in his life and that was to get the University of Houston recognized as a state-supported school. Now, this was opposed by Texas A&M, University of Texas, Texas Tech and other state supported schools. They fought against this, but uh, Bruce won his last battle. And in 1961, University of Houston became a state supported school. Uh, Bruce is buried in the Arlington National Cemetery. John Hilger, a Doolittle Raider, class of 1930. He was born in Sherman. His father was a stone cutter. He entered A&M in 1926 to study mechanical engineering. But he had to drop out in 1929 because of, of money problems. Now, you find this is very common when you read the, the, the history of these different people. I know in the Medal of Honor book, six out of the seven Aggies uh, in that book are winners of the Medal of Honor. Six out of the seven had financial problems all through school. Some had to drop out. Some had to drop out and come back. Uh, they worked while they were there. Now, a number of these people that I have in this book also worked their way through school. So you have to remember this is in the 1930s during the Great Depression. Any of you here that are old enough to remember that. Now, this is Hilger after he became a general. He graduated in 1932 and he entered the Army Flying Corps and was um, placed on active duty as a flying cadet. And later, later he was uh, commissioned as a lieutenant. In 1940, May of 1940, he took command of the 89th Reconnaissance Squadron. Uh, this was after Pearl, uh, and then when Pearl Harbor came along, they did patrol, patrols along the Pacific Coast. Uh, he was assigned to, to uh, do little, the Doolittle Special Mission and became the executive officer of the Doolittle Force. They, were, they had B-25, they, they had 16 B-25s uh, that were loaded on the USS Hornet and headed for the Pacific. Okay, this is Madame Chang I check. Madame Chang met all these raiders after they, uh, after they landed in China or jumped into China. Now, show, show you where it took place across the Pacific they, they were supposed to get 250 miles, but they were spotted at 400 miles by the Japanese, so Halsey said launch, you know, launch the planes, and they did, which meant they may not have enough gasoline to recover at the uh, fields in China. And they bombed Tokyo, they bombed Yokohama, Osaki, Nagasaki, Kobe, and then from there they flew to China. Most of them made it to China. A few were shot down here in Japan, but uh, the people that made it to China and, and bailed out, all, all the planes crashed. They had to bail out because they ran out of gas. 
but they were recovered by Chinese, uh, friendly Chinese forces and returned to Chongming where they were sent back to the States. And that was that picture where uh, Hilger was with Ma Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Now Hilger returned to the Far East uh, and was assigned to the first bomb group in the China Air Task Force. But the problem was they would not allow him to fly combat missions because they, they felt that if he ever had to bail out or was ever captured, they would immediately execute him since he'd been on the Tokyo raid. So they sent him to, uh, to the Navy <coughs> Admiral Nemesis staff in 1943 where he finished out the uh, war. He was back in, in combat again in Korea and he was, he was commanding a bomb group of B-29s bombing uh, North Korea. He retired in 1966 and uh, he died in 1952. Now his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean off the, off the uh, California coast. Now, anybody know who that is? James Earl Rudder. We ought to know that. He was born in Eden. His father was a livestock commission man. Now he entered John Tarleton Agricultural College in 1927 uh, and he was on a football scholarship. And the football scholarship consisted of the coach helping him get jobs around campus, mowing lawns, uh, waiting tables, sweeping out classrooms. That was his scholarship. But he, but he did uh, stay there a couple of years. And then he uh, came to a in 1930 and he played on the freshman team for a year. At that time, fr freshmen or transfer students could not play the first year uh, of college ball. He entered the Army and then he was selected to command the 2nd Ranger Battalion. And of course, he won his fame at Pont de Hoc. I'm sure you've all heard of that. Uh, there he is as a general in the reserves. He won his fame at Pont de Hoc. And then he was in the uh, Hurtgen Forest when he was selected to command an infantry regiment in the 28th Division. And uh, this regiment had been, like the 28th Division, really beat up in the Hurtgen Forest. And he, they took uh, over a quiet sector in, in the Ardennes. And so much for quiet sectors because uh, that's where the uh, Battle of the Bulge was fought. And uh, his regiment did an outstanding job. They supported, uh, or they protected the north flank of the uh, of the uh, the left flank of the German bulge, and they held long enough that they could bring the U.S. forces into Bastogne. Now his regiment moved down to the Alsace, Colmar. And there they, they uh, along with French troops, they conquered, the po they captured, they captured Colmar. And I'm gonna point out another place, San Maria Old Mine. And this is something that Rudder wouldn't talk about to anyone. And that was his regiment had to execute an American soldier for des as a deserter, and this is Private Slovak, and some of you may have seen the movie, The Execution of Private Slovak, or there's a book, The Execution of Private Slovak. Um, but anyway, that was one ep episode in Rudder's life that he would never, never speak of, because it was a traumatic experience for him. And this is Rudder leading the victory parade through Colmar. Now, you all know that Rudder became the president of Texas A&M, in fact, he was picked by uh, Grover Shivers, uh, not Grover Shivers, but uh, Alan Shivers. Uh, Alan, uh, Governor Shivers said, get over there and straighten that place out. And so he came over and, and did what he could. Now, under his leadership, uh, females were admitted and the Corps was made non-compulsory. My opinion is he got it half right, but that, that's all right. <laughs> He died in 1970 while it, still in office, and he was, la in, he was laid in state, I guess you would say, in the, 
administration building. It's the first time this has ever happened on the campus of A&M. The second, there's only two occasions. The second one was an Eli Whiteley uh, Medal of Honor recipient was also honored in this way. Now this is one of my, my favorite guys. This is Tex Hill, David Lee Tex Hill, Flying Tiger, class of 1938. He was born in Korea. His father was a, uh, a Presbyterian missionary. Now they lived around in Kentucky, Virginia, and, and finally uh, his father got a church in San Antonio. Uh, Tex entered A&M in 1934 to study chemical engineering. Now he had a problem his sophomore year because uh, they were going to the military science uh, department was going to form a new company of chemical warfare or Chemical Warfare uh, Corps. And they told him, you're gonna transfer from the cavalry to the Chemical Warfare, and he said, no, he's not. They said, well, you are. He said, no, I'm gonna change my major. So he changed his major and went back and said, I'm no longer a chemical engineer. They said, well, okay, but you're still going to the Chemical uh, Warfare <laughs> Company. Uh, so Tex dropped out of school, and he went up to Sherman and uh, attended Austin College. This painting hangs in the, in the Pentagon, and this is Tex Hill when he was a flying tiger. He was recruited in 1941 to join the American Volunteer Group, which later was called the Flying Tigers, uh, to serve in China for a year. <clears throat> now, the incentive for this is, he, at this time, he's, in the, he's a naval ensign aviator, and the incentive was that he's making probably less than $200, and they said, well, we're gonna pay you $600 if you're a wingman, and if you're a, a flight leader, we're gonna pay you $750, and, and so on and so up. And uh, said, not only that, for every Japanese plane you destroy, we're gonna pay you $500. Well, this is kinda of hard to pass up. So anyway, Tex and about 100, uh, pilots signed up for that. They, they recruited from the, the services. About 100 pilots signed up for it. And they were soon on their way to China and they made a big difference uh, in the war there in China. Tex himself shot down, he's uh, credited with 12 Japanese planes shot down. And this doesn't count many, many that they destroyed on the ground. And after his uh, year was up, the AVG American Volunteer Group was disbanded and all these people were asked to join the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army Air Force. And about 26 of them did. The rest of the bulk that went home. But Texas was one of those that joined and uh, <coughs> spent another tour in China. Then he went home on leave and, or, or assignment and Chenault, who was commanding the, uh, the Flying Tigers and the Chinese uh, Air Task Force asked him to come back. And so uh, <clears throat> Tex went back to China for a second time. Who remembers the movie Flying Tigers? Anybody remember that? Okay, do you know who the main character was in there? Or played by, that was John Wayne. And that character was based on good old Tex Hill, and uh, they became good friends. They were made friends as long as they were both alive, or they were alive. In fact, um, <clears throat> Wayne kind of got him into the movie business. And he went out and he was gonna be a producer or something. The first task they gave him was to go to the Congo and bring back some gorillas. <laughs> well, they were gonna film Mighty Joe Young. Well, they got to the Congo and they found out you can't uh, you know, you can't uh, bring gorillas back to the Congo, so he had to go to another country. And there's a little Greek guy who says, I can get them out for you for so much dollars. He said, I can, you know, bribe these guys. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> they, they captured some small gorillas and brought them back. But after that, he decided, that, you know, he didn't want to be in show business. <clears throat> but he did go, he did go into the, uh, uh, to the, uh, he wanted to go back in the Air Force, but uh, unfortunately something happened, he didn't make it, but he did organize the Texas Air National Guard and became a Brigadier General. And Tex died at age 92. 
and he's buried down at the Fort Sam National Cemetery. I got to show you this one. Uh, Tex Hill was in the Navy, Naval Aviator. This is his first landing. <laughs> but the good news was that he made 99 other landings that not like this one. Okay, anybody know this one? Tiger Teague, you got it. Tiger Teague, class of 1932. He got the name Tiger because he was such a fierce player on, on the football field. He was born in Woodward, Oklahoma, but moved to Mena, Arkansas, where his father was in the timber business. He entered A&M in 1928 to study agriculture education. Now, his father died when he was a sophomore, so he was left to pay his own college expenses. Uh, he cleaned stalls. He actually worked on uh, the Kyle Field when it was being built as a laborer. He worked in the post office. And one semester, having no money for a dorm room, he, uh, he slept in the animal pavilion. And his buddies would slip him food uh, during this time. Uh, he served in the <coughs> CCC as a reserve officer. And that was pretty popular at that time in the CCC camp, Civilian Conservation Corps camps. Uh, they would have a, a reserve officer come in and command these camps. So he did that. He went on active duty in 1940, and he commanded the uh, battalion of the 314th Infantry Regiment in the 79th Division. This is a picture of Teague as a colonel. He was promoted to colonel while he was at, uh, uh, at the hospital in Temple. Now this is, this is his uh, combat tour of, the, of Europe. He started up here at Cherbourg, they, they captured Cherbourg, then he went down to, to La Haye, captured that, big battle there. Swung around through Le Mans. And then another big battle right here on the Seine River at Mon Grascourt. Then up towards Belgium, and diverted back down to Alsace, to Hagenau and Lauterberg. Now in Lauterberg, that's where he was wounded. He was behind a tree. His problem was he had his left leg sticking out behind the tree. He didn't get the word, you know, <laughs> get it all behind the tree. So he had his left leg sticking out and he got hit in the leg and took out about four inches of bone out of his left leg. He spent two years in the hospital. And there's the McCluskey Hospital. is now the Olin Teague Veterans Center, or whatever they call it, up in Temple, Texas. Now, this shows you his, his leg. You can see that special walking device there. And it, he's with Eisenhower. I don't know if any of you know this fellow on your right, and that's Bill Becker, who was a bull when I was here as a cadet. Later on, became a, a major general. No. <laughs> that was the 1946 homecoming muster. Uh, Tiger Teague was elected to the House of Representatives and served 32 years. He was a great champion uh, for veterans and also for the space program. And after he retired because of medical reasons, Phil Graham took his, uh, took his uh, seat in the house. He died in 1981 and he's buried at the Arlington National Cemetery. Now here's another one of my favorites. Ray Murray. He was born in Los Angeles. His father was a Boy Scout executive and so they moved all over the country and finally wound up in Mercedes, Texas, where he went to high school. He uh, entered A&M in 1930, and he played basketball and football. He was an all-Southwest Conference in and selected the most valuable player in 1932. He was commissioned a Marine Corps Lieutenant in 1935. 
Now, at this time, the Marine Corps was expanding and they needed 100 new lieutenants. So they went out to 50 colleges, said, give me your two best uh, people, two best students. So the a and they came to A&M and at, at, at the end they, uh, of that story is that A&M furnished three instead of two for the Marine Corps. Uh, <clears throat> Murray had a choice to make. Do I want to be a coach nine months of the year, making $90 a, year, a month, or do I want to be a Marine Lieutenant making $125 a month for 12 months? Well, it wasn't much of a choice, so he, he went in the Marine Corps. Now his career reads like the history of the Marine Corps in the 20th century. He started off, he was stationed in China. And then when he came back from China, he was sent with the Marine Brigade in 1940 up to Iceland to relieve the British forces there. Uh, here he is as a, as a general. He's a big man, 6'4". He saw his first combat in Guadalcanal. Now that was the first land offensive that the United States took in World War II. Later on from Guadalcanal, he went to Tar Tarawa, Tarawa, which was a bloody battle, and then from there to Saipan, where he was seriously wounded and evacuated to the States. And his next war was in Korea. And this is, he was there for the full ride. Started out Pus Pusan Perimeter. From there he went around to, to uh, Incheon, made the invasion in Incheon. From there, they captured Seoul. And then, they withdrew, got on ships, went around to uh, North Korea in this area. And there they marched, walked, or trucked up north to the Chosen Reservoir. Now this is in November of 1952. Uh, not knowing that the Chinese had already come into the war. And he's most famous for commanding the uh, 5th Marine Regiment at Chosen, and they had to fight their way back to the sea. And it's interesting to note that during World War II, he was a battalion commander as a major, normally this, this battalion is commanded by Lieutenant Colonel. In, World War, in Korea, he was a regimental commander as a lieutenant colonel, and normally a regiment is commanded by a colonel. So that, that tells you right there, you know, he had something. Colonel Woodall, he was one of the chosen chosen? Chosen frozen, yeah. Frozen chosen, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. yeah, and they fought their way from, they had to fight their way all the way back to the sea. With Chesty Fuller? Chesty Fuller was back with the PR guys, back, back in the rear. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> if you've ever read about that. <laughs> He's a great guy. But that, that's, he's most famous for, for uh, the action in, uh, in the Chosen, Chosen Reservoir area. And the guy was awarded two Navy Crosses, an Army Distinguished Service Cross, and four Silver Stars. Now that tells you he probably was around somewhere. This is MacArthur meeting him at uh, Inchon after they had uh, successfully invaded Inchon as reported that, uh, you know, he, they introduced him to MacArthur. And uh, after, after uh, Murray walked away, MacArthur turned to his aide and says, give that man a silver star. And the guy said, what's his name? I don't know what his name is. Get him a silver star. So he picked up a silver star there and MacArthur didn't even remember what his name was. <laughs> and these are Marines moving out of, uh, out of the north, headed back to the sea, and they took Terrible casualties. Uh, his third war was Vietnam. He was sent over as the deputy commander of the third Marine Amphibious Force. Which, if you know about these things, you know that some guy comes in as the deputy commander, that means that he's gonna be the next commander. That's the Army thing. Which meant he would've gotten a third star. He was a major general at that time. But he had some medical problems and was returned to the States. And they found the problem was a viral infection in the inner ear. 
and so later on he was discharged. Uh, he died in 19, 2004 and buried in California. You know, in 1942, uh, there were dark days here in the States, in the United States. Uh, France had been overrun. Most of Europe had been overrun by the Germans. Japanese had captured the Philippines. Our Navy was on the floor of the, you know, the bottom of the ocean, bottom of the sea at Pearl Harbor. So things were really bad. The only good spark, good news we had during that period was the Doolittle Raid. But that was just a pinprick. And then, so America needed a hero. America needed a victory. Well, Nimitz gave him the victory, and George Gay provided the hero. I couldn't find a, a cadet picture of him, a, a student picture. You know, it used to irritate me that people would go to a and and not have the picture in the, in the annual, in the Aggie Land or the Long Arm, but there are a lot of people that don't. So he was born in Waco, but he's raised in Dallas, and then he moved to Houston. His father was a title man. He entered A&M in 1936. He attended five semesters and two summer sessions, and then because of lack of funds, he had to drop out of school. <clears throat> he enlisted in the Navy in 1941 and was commissioned in September 1941 as an ensign. His unit was Torpedo Squadron 8, and it was on the board the USS Hornet. And if you remember, the USS Hornet was the same ship that took Doolittle uh, to Japan. And Gay was on the ship when the Doolittle raider during the Doolittle uh, time. Now, after uh, <clears throat> after returning from the Doolittle raid, it was they had some intelligence that the uh, Japanese were about to attack Midway. Here's Midway Island here. Japanese were coming in here. U.S. fleet left Hawaii and the West Coast and met them, met them outside of Midway. Now, Torpedo Squadron 8 flew this TBD-1 torpedo bomber, which was old and obsolete. New bombers were, were being provided. In fact, they arrived in, in California too late to get loaded on the, on the Hornet. So they left their new planes back on the deck, on dock, took this old plane low and slow. And then when they put a torpedo on it, uh, it's even slower, about 90 miles an hour, as fast as it'll go. Beside that, in those days, a lot of the torpedoes were duds, so uh, they really didn't have a chance. Their squadron was the last one to make the strike on the Japanese fleet. So that meant everybody was alert. They came in low, 10, 20 feet off the, off the waves, making a torpedo run. Every plane, all, think of 18, all 18 planes, or all planes in the squadron were shot down. And everyone was lost, except Gay. He was the sole survivor. And he was right in the middle of the Japanese fleet. Cruisers, destroyers were just passing within a few feet of him as he was there in the water. He took a cushion from the plane bent it into a V shape, put it over his head, and when a, you know, keep it turned away from the ship as they would pass by. He said on one occasion, the Japanese sailors were pointing at him. Yes, they saw him, but they were moving on for better things. They didn't stop trying to pick him up or anything. So anyway, uh, he survived that. The next day, fortunately, a seaplane came and picked him up. Gay came back to the campus after his ordeal in fact, he came back with Hilger. They were on a bond tour around the United States. A lot of you probably remember those bond tours that they had. And anyway, he was back on the campus and visited with, uh, with the cadets. So he's known as the sole survivor of squad Torpedo Squadron 8. After the war, he became a pilot for Trans World Airlines. And he died in 1994. His ashes were flown to the Pacific, to the area where his torpedo squadron went down and scattered over, the, over that area. So he rejoined his comrades, was torpedo squadron eight. Now this is James Francis Hollingsworth, class of 1940. He was born in Sanger. Now Sanger is up near 
Denison, right in that area. Not, yeah, Denton, up near Denton. Uh, his father was a farmer. He attended North Texas Agricultural College for, for a year, and then he came to AM. Uh, and he's studying animal hu dairy husbandry. He graduated in 1940 and was called to active duty and was assigned to the 2nd Armored Division at, at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And his division commander was George Patton. He fought with the 2nd Armored Division in North Africa and in Sicily. And his unit landed on the Normandy beachhead shortly after D-Day. Here's a picture of Hollywood. Now, you've heard the term war lover. I think this is a good example of a war lover. This guy loved to fight. I mean, even when there was a general officer who was going out and doing things like uh, fighting like a private. But he loved to fight. He, he had three distinguished service crosses. Now, this is like Murray. This is almost unheard of to get three, three at that level. Anyway, you'll see his, uh, his combat route. He was in the group that, uh, in the Third Army, that swung around to the south to flank the German army. And they, they made good, good progress across France into Belgium. And in, in Belgium, in the Battle of the Bulge, the Second Armored Division met the Second SS Panzer Division and destroyed the Second SS Panzer Division. By, uh, towards the end of the war, he had reached the Elbe River. And he claimed that if they had given him, let him cross the Elbe and given him 11 days, he could have been in, in uh, Berlin, but they didn't do that. They had a big fight there at Schoenenbeck. He was wounded there. Put him in the hospital and he slipped out and went back to his unit. Another occasion, along in here somewhere, he was wounded and they sent him to, to uh, England to reco recover. He went AWOL from the hospital in England, hopped a ride across to Paris, hopped a, a truck, one transportation truck, going towards the front. When he got pretty close to the front, he called his outfit and says, send me a jeep. They sent him a jeep and he's back in combat. At one time, he lined 32 tanks up and you know what the command was? Charge. That hadn't been heard in a long time in the U.S. Army, but he, the command was charged and they charged down the hill and of course the Germans took off. Uh, this is the Sherman tank that, that uh, Second Armored used. It, it was a good tank, but the Germans had a lot better tanks but we had a lot more tanks, so it kind of evened out. <clears throat> this is Hollingsworth at Anlo. This is uh, his, probably his last major battle, uh, <clears throat> Easter Offensive in 1972, when the North, North Vietnamese uh, came into uh, uh, South Vietnam in force. You may know this guy in the background. That's Frank Muller. Frank Muller was his aide at that time. And this is, this is Hollingsworth uh, at the Battle of Anlo. And there are a couple of good books written about the Battle of Anlo, which is a major, one of the major battles in uh, uh, Vietnam. <clears throat> uh, Frank Muller told me that, you know, when all this was going on, that Hollingsworth flew down to Saigon, which is only like 30 or 40 miles away, and went in to see Abrams and said, listen, if you don't give me that air group that's on that carrier out in the, out in the ocean, give me, give me the complete resources of that carrier group, then the, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese are gonna be in Saigon in three days. And that's how serious it is. And guess what, Abrams gave him all the, all the assets from the Navy air group, and he put them to good use. <clears throat> now, I, I told you he was awarded three distinguished service crosses, also four silver stars and six purple hearts. Now his uh, decorations are on uh, display in the core center. And if you haven't been to the core center, you really ought to get over there and, and uh, take a look. Because there's, there's, it's a wonderful place. I call it the jewel in the crown. But it's a wonderful place and uh, a lot of interesting stuff. And you can see all of this, uh, this display that we have over there for uh, Hollingsworth. He died at the age, age of 91, buried in Arlington National Cemetery. 
I didn't point out where Ann Lowe was. It's right in that area there. This is J. Thorpe Robbins, class of 1940. He was born in Coolidge. I had to look Coolidge up on the map. It's up near Mahia. It's just a small little town. His father was a blacksmith, but he owned four different farms around the country. And uh, uh, Robbins came to A&M in 1936 to study agriculture. He was called to active duty in the Army Air Corps in 1941. And he served with the 8th Fighter Group in, uh, in the Pacific. And here he is as a general later in life. And that's the P-38 that he flew in the South Pacific. He was flying out of Port, Mor Port Moresby. Later on, he went down to Milby Bay. Their main target was Rabao, which is the main Japanese uh, position in, in the Southwest Pacific. But he shot, that's, I don't know if I told you, he shot down 22 planes. He was the, uh, he was the top Aggie ace. He was number four on Pacific War aces. Uh, here he is with his P-38, and you see his name, Jordanina, four. That meant that's the fourth time he, he kept getting planes shot up. But the way he came up with that name, J is for his name, and Ina, I-N-A. That was his girlfriend, fiance, and later his wife. He met her. He, she was a nurse, and he was evacuated to, to Australia to the hospital for malaria. And he met her there. Then he kept making trips back to Australia during all this time, whenever he could, uh, managed to get back. And they eventually got married there in Australia. So her name was Ina. And that's how he came up with the plane, the name of the plane. Now this is, uh, I guess you could consider him a, a local guy. It's Marion Pugh. Some of you may have known him. He was born in Fort Worth, and his father was a, uh, operated grocery store. And he was an outstanding high school athlete. And he was all district and all state while in high school. He was recruited by Homer Norton. And there's an interesting story, I'm not gonna go into it here, about how, how Homer got the money to, to uh, fund some scholarships for these guys. Homer Norton was, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> Marion Pugh was one of them. So he entered A&M in 1937 on an athletic scholarship. He was the quarterback of the 1939 football team. In 1942, he was called to active duty and assigned to the tank destroyers at Fort Hood. And in fact, his battalion were, were the school troops there for a while. His battalion was the 893rd Tank Destroyer Battalion. One of his lieutenants uh, later on was uh, Tony Leonard, and you, you probably read about him if you read my first book. They landed in October, I mean July of 1944, and they, they were involved in the liberation of Paris. Now I want you to see that. Now, Jerry, you need a suit like that. That's it. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. that that's a, what are you, polyester, is that what that is? Anyway, that's pretty sharp in there today. In fact, I think Ken Durham still has his Palmaster <laughs> suit. Uh, there he is as a football player, 1939. Now, here's what I was telling you. Uh, they upgraded the tank destroyers. This is the M10, which has a 90 millimeter cannon on it, as opposed to 75 on the other half track, which was found unsatisfactory. And this is on the Call Trail, K A L L Call Trail, in uh, the Ardennes, I mean the uh, Hurtgen Forest. And this is the Hurtgen Forest. Now this is one of the bloodiest battles in World War II for the Americans. And it's one of the longest battles. There were 20, 24,000 killed, wounded, captured, or, or missing from the, the, only three divisions fought there. And there were also 9,000 trench foot, combat fatigue, or respiratory diseases. So that was all out of three divisions. And when you bounce that against the Battle of the Bulge, which everybody knows about the Battle of the Bulge, there were 29 divisions there, and the casualties were somewhere between, wherever you, it's different wherever you look, but between 80 and 100,000. So that was out of 29 divisions, and 
as opposed to the three divisions of Hurricane Forest. <clears throat> now, like I said, one of his lieutenants was Attorney Leonard, and he was lost in this battle, missing. In, uh, in 1945, early 45, Pew crossed through the same area with another, attached to another division, and he spent some time trying to locate Tony Leonard because he said the, battle was uh, the battlefield was still littered with dead, but he never could locate him. Tony was located in, in 1950. After the war, he came back. Well, he played, uh, he had already played some professional ball. But he came back, at one time he was the freshman coach for the Texas A&M uh, football team. He came back and was in the real estate business and in the lumber business, and he finally opened a lumber yard on what is now Pew Avenue or Pew Drive over there near Olson Field. Uh, he, he died in 1976. He went, he went to uh, uh, Somerville at that steakhouse and he choked on a piece of meat. And then that, that's where he died. And he's buried here in the College Station City Library. I mean, City, city Cemetery. <laughs> That'd be a little more convenient. Uh, I, uh, I took a copy of my book over to uh, the football coach the other day. And I said, Coach, I've got a chapter in here about Marion Pugh. Now, I know you give the Marion Pugh Spirit Award. You give the Marion Pugh Most Valuable Player. I said, but these kids, I, I would bet you they don't have any idea who Marion Pugh is other than there's a street named after him. And he said, you're right. So I said, well, I hope you, whoever gets these awards, you will have them read, if nothing else, just read the chapter on Marion Pugh so they will know a little something about it. And to me, that's important, but I don't know if it's important to these kids. But this is Robert Livingston, Bob Aiken class of 1943. He was born in Nashville, Tennessee. His father was an insurance executive, but he grew up in Dallas. He entered A&M in 1960. Uh, he was called to active duty in 1967 and completed Army flight school. And he went to Vietnam to fly, fly a gunship. Uh, this is Bob a little later on. And this is a picture of his actual gunship in Vietnam. After flying gunships for one year, he extended for a second tour, and he requested uh, ground troops, and he was sent to be a co rifle company commander in the 101st Airborne Division. Now, his unit participated in the Cambodian incursion, as they, as they call it, in 1970. He was up here with the 4th Division, and they was moved into that area. There was also other uh, incursions by the uh, South Vietnamese and American units further south. <clears throat> but this was, uh, you know, this is certainly welcomed by the, by the uh, ground forces in Vietnam. Uh, his unit located a base camp that yielded 500 tons of rice and over 800 weapons and a huge pile of munitions. Some they evacuated, most had to be destroyed in place. Now, after a year with the infantry, he extended for a third time. Now, this is pretty unusual. I knew some people extended a second time, but very few that ever, the ones that extended a third time had a death wish. That, that was my, uh, my idea of these guys. And some of them I knew that got their wish. Now, this is Bob on that sweep through the base camp in Cambodia. He's on the right there. After, uh, during his third tour in Vietnam, he was training, uh, training Vietnamese pilots. And he was in a cra helicopter crash, evacuated to the States, spent 22 months in Brooks General Hospital in San Antonio. Uh, when he returned to active duty, he went to Fort Benning, Georgia, attended the officer's advanced course, and then later went to Ranger School where he was an honor graduate. <clears throat> His next assignment was in Korea, uh, where he experienced some medical problems and was eventually given a medical discharge. And in civilian life, he was a commercial helicopter pilot, a private investigator, and taught computer science at the University of North Texas. Uh, he had an unbelievable number of decorations. 
he was um, given the Silver Star, or won the Silver Star, Steam's Flying Cross, six Bronze Stars, Purple Heart, and 39 Air Medals. Uh, I always refer to the Air Medals as frequent flyer medals, but that, uh, his was a little more serious than mine, I would imagine. <clears throat> but he died of a brain tumor in 1998, and he's buried in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, are there any questions?